Hello and welcome to Discussing Fitchburg Now. I'm your host, Sam Squalia. This week's show, we're talking about veterans' resources. So on our first segment, we're going to be talking about uh, with uh, the Fitchburg Veterans Commissioner, Michelle Marino, and we have Gabe Nutter from the Department of Veterans Services, correct. the team leader for the SAFE team. SAFE team, correct. SAFE team, and what is that again? The SAFE team is the Statewide Advocacy for Veterans Empowerment. Statewide Advocacy for Veterans Empowerment. Correct. That's a, that's a good acronym. It's a long one, yes. Yes. All right, so uh, on our second half, we are going to be having on Rich Bastine, who is the director of the uh, Massachusetts Veterans Cemetery. Memorial Cemetery. Memorial Cemetery, yep. see, in Winchenden and Agawam. So, uh, but first on, welcome. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, let's start talking about veterans resources with a history of you know veterans benefits you know how did how did veteran benefits even come about well actually they've been around forever since world war one um world war one world war one well actually the civil war civil war the civil war, war going even further back that's yeah. gabe's day mm -hmm. yeah. so <laughs> um the the biggest one that uh we do out of the office up here in Fitchburg is a Chapter 115 program. The Chapter 115 it's benefits program, that's a federal? A, nope, that's, that's, that's a state, state run. That veterans. is state run, and it's one of a kind in the entire country. Massachusetts is the only state that has anything like it. Really? And um, what it's aimed to do, it's, those, it's a needs-based program for those that uh, lower income, uh, they may, or vets that might be out of work temporarily, looking for a new place, or homeless vets, we help house them with first, last, and security. Uh, qualifications, basically you have to be other than dishonorably discharged. If you're a peacetime vet, you have to have 180 days in the service, and if you have one day of wartime, you only have to be in for 90 days. So, so okay, <clears throat> so if you haven't been to any um, combat situation? Not a requirement. Uh, then that doesn't. You just have to have served for 180 days? That's yep. it? That seems low. Active, active duty, though. It's active the difference duty. between active duty yep. time, which is Title 10, and then Title 30 or Title 32, which is the state time through the National Guard. Okay, so, so I guess that, yeah. what is a veteran, right? Is that, That's, like, what that, defines a veteran? That is an extremely loaded question. Yeah. Yeah. There are many different definitions of a veteran. What defines a veteran for benefits? So for benefits of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, it, Michelle mentioned. It depends on if you're going federal or or if you're going state, it depends if you served before 1980 or after. There are so many different so variations. If you served before 1980, there are different qualifications? Yes. You could serve one day and be qualified for certain benefits. After 1980, it has to be 24 months, or you need to have a service-connected disability. Which is any so, injury or... Yep situation that was incurred during your your active duty service so it sounds a little it sounds like this could be a little complicated yeah. which is one of the services that you provide in uh, as a, as the the veterans commissioner yeah. is helping veterans to navigate these to sum, to sum it up in a rules. nutshell what we do at the Department of Veterans Services here in Fitchburg we're one-stop shopping uh, we're resources for veterans whether they're looking for financial whether they're looking for um, health care services we'll help them get into the health care system they may be in a crisis situation where Gabe would come in him and his department uh, anything veteran based is what we do up in our office. We're basically resources. I'll help vets file claims for their disabilities. Um, anything veteran related. Dependents of veterans, mostly the widows of veterans. They, um, we have a lot of widows that are on the Chapter 115 program. Uh, I'll help them file for federal benefits, burial benefits, um, widows benefits. So the Chapter 115 program is the state yes. veterans benefits program. Mm -hmm. What is the federal um, program called? So the, the federal program is a, it's the VA. It's a very large. The, the VA. The VA yeah. as a whole. There's multiple styles of the like VA. Like what, what is that said? That's our health care clinic yeah, that, uh, yeah. at the yep, at right the here. Social Security so there's office, here. A building a, uh, in yep. the Upper Common. Correct. That's the federal VA clinic. That is a federal VA community-based yeah. outpatient clinic. Community-based outpatient clinic. So that falls under VA Central Western Mass. 
which is uh, headquartered out of Northampton, mm -hmm. which is, I don't know if everybody's ever been out there, but it's, it's one of the older VAs. Yeah. A lot of history down there. Uh, but the state's broken up into different areas. So uh, this area used to fall under Bedford when they realigned, uh, went out to Northampton. So there's yeah. also um, some clinics down in the Worcester area that people in the Fitchburg area can go see for specialty clinics as an ophthalmology or audiology or any kind of something you have to drive all the Northampton for. Mm. Um, but that's literally just one piece. The Veterans Health Administration is just one tiny piece of the VA. It's a major piece of the VA, but there's also the Veterans Benefit Administration and Veterans Burial Administration. And the education. And then there's education. The there's there's, the, yeah. there's the, the GI Bill. There's the Montgomery GI Bill. There's the post 9 11 GI Bill. Now there's the Forever GI Bill. I'm not sure what that next forever? step bill. It used to be a, a time you had to use it by a certain date. Oh, yeah. So when I, I signed up for the military in 2004 as medical discharge in 2000. So I had a certain amount of time to use my Montgomery GI Bill, yeah. and if I had signed up for the post 11, post 9/11 GI Bill, which I could have switched over to, but I was it was just more paperwork. They had like another five or six years I could have used mm. uh, or been eligible to use that. And now I don't think there is. So you had to go to time. so you yeah. have to go to college right away after you are discharged you, you, from services. So the pretty G, much, yes. Yeah, well, the G, yes. GI Bill, uh, the limit was 10 years, at least with my period. I was in during the Gulf, yep. so that was 10 years, and then. Depending on how much time, if you're at reserves or guard, you earn a certain amount of time to be able to go and you have to use it. They're the educational part of it, they just, that's the one that varies the most throughout, depending on when you serve. Education, uh, yeah. depending on when you serve and what branch of the armed nope. services? The branch really doesn't matter. Oh, okay. It's either reserve or active duty. Oh, okay. National Guard, reserve, reserve. or National Guard, active duty? So, so there's, there's no. National Guard is, is very <laughs> specific. This, we could do a two-week segment. Right. I know. This is so really all amazing. branches have a reserve, but only the Army and the Air Force have a National Guard. Okay. So the National Guard belongs, you know, technically it's part of the U.S. Army. So the Massachusetts National Guard, when they go to basic training, they're in with U.S. Army active duty soldiers and other National Guard soldiers from other states. But when they come home, back to their state, to the Massachusetts and New Hampshire National Guard, their commander in chief is the governor of that state. The governor can call them up to help out with issues in the state, whether it's storm relief or, you know, shoveling out hydrants in a hole after a blizzard or working on the tornadoes down in Springfield, any kind of natural disaster or the disaster like the Boston Marathon bombing. They call out the National Guard. They can, yeah. they can call them up. That's state time. That's not, doesn't count toward active duty time. But at any time, the President of the United States, who is the Commander in Chief of the nation's armed forces, can say, okay, we need these X amount of units going someplace. All right, we're going to grab the 181 from Massachusetts, we're going to grab the 101 from New Hampshire, and they get absorbed into the United States Army. And then that's, they're on Title 10 orders, and then they're part of the actual United States Army at that time. The reserve can be called up? Well, the, the reserve is all, that's the National Guard. The reserve can always be called the same way, but the reserve always belongs to the U.S. Army, whereas the National Guard belongs to that state that it is attached to. Okay. Now, are they veterans? It, well, you know what? For so this is a loaded question. So it all depends so on what they've done. Let's try to break it down. Right. I have a good friend of mine, a good family friend, who was in the National Guard for 42 years. 40 of that 42 years, he was full-time National Guard. Every morning he got up and put his boots and his uniform on and went to work. 42 years? 42 years. He was, was full-time National Guard? For 40 of that, out of the 42. Okay. He was not considered a veteran under VA standards until year 37 when he got deployed to Iraq to Abu Ghraib prison. Okay, so he needed, so when you're in the National Guard, you need to be in combat, some sort of combat situation? It, some sort of situation, unless you have multiple years, a lot of people have multiple years active duty, and then they leave and go into the National Guard. Then because they had the multiple years active duty, that puts him at that veteran qualification, basically, for the federal government. Okay. Yeah. Um, but if they don't have that, and a lot of people didn't have that up until recently, until after 9-11, uh, that the only benefits he would have gotten were his, his military retirement, you know, because he had his, yeah. his so many over 20 years in, actually, his 42 years in there. In the cemetery. He would have had uh, access to a cemetery, had access to his retirement, and TRICARE. Access to the, the Veterans mm -hmm. Memorial Cemetery? Yeah, National Guard and Reserves, they yeah. have to have done at least 20 years to be able to be buried up at one of the memorial cemeteries. 20 years for National Guard or Reserve? Yep. Okay. Yep. So if you're in any other branch of the military, besides National Guard and Reserve, yep. what does it take to be a veteran? <laughs> so again, depending federal, on what we're looking for. Federal for. standards and state standards. Well, what do you, what, what, in Massachusetts, we have uh, the, the this, chapter 115. This program, is where I was saying. It's one of the best ones, right? So yep. what qualifies, let's talk about just the chapter 115. This program. is where I was saying the 90 and the 180. Yeah. Okay. So 90 days active duty in a time of war, one day in a war zone, peace time at the 180 days active duty yep. to be qualified for state level services, which is the chapter 115 is the you know, the services of the veteran service yeah. officers, the services from the Department of Veteran Services. 
Uh, the save team, we work a lot more on the crisis side of things. So we're not bound by people's discharge status or time in service. Okay, if, yes. they've, if they've raised their right hand and they served three days in the National Guard and didn't make it through reception and basic training, but they came home and they're having some sort of issue and probably they might have a pre-existing issue why they had trouble in the military, we will work with them. They're not going to qualify for a lot of veteran-based services, but we can still work with them and guide them through the civilian route to get them the help and the care and the treatment that they need. You're not going to turn people down at Absolutely. the time of need. Not at all. Not yeah, at all. Or I mean, at least. I, I wish we had about 50 more of us. There's only about 13 of us statewide. 13 on the save team? On the save team statewide. That encompasses the, our family outreach, um, our trial court, um, jail diversion programs. Um, we have people attached, uh, attached to the veteran treatment courts located across the Commonwealth, and then as well as the regular save team which is the uh, crisis intervention and suicide prevention uh, at our historic roots. How long has your, uh, how long has the SAVE team been in um, existence it was, in Massachusetts? Uh, we were just talking about that. It was, uh, it's going to be, I believe it's 10 years next month. 10 years that it, since it's been started. Since its inception, yeah. And uh, there's, there's not, there hasn't been many of us on the team over here. A lot of us are still around that have been, I mean, I wasn't there from the beginning. I've been there since uh, the end of 2011. But, um, we haven't had a huge turnaround. We've had a lot of the same people there for a long time, and they, they really understand the core mission and what it takes to get out and, and outreach to these veterans and locate them and identify the problems that these people may be having. So, uh, like maybe 10 years ago, there, there was, uh, there was. What did you have for veterans in was, crisis? There, there wasn't what much. What kind of services yeah. were there? There wasn't much. People you know, were calling. Really? People were calling up the local veterans commissioner. <laughs> You're like, basically. Oh no! That's, that's basically. exactly what happened. So I got yeah. out, I got medical discharge in 2008. I moved back to Massachusetts in 2009. And I had no intention of ever getting out. I was going to stand for 40 years to let me. So I had no idea how to be a civilian, what I was going to do, where I was going to go, and I was just winging it. And it took me walking into a veteran service officer's office and say, hey, here I am, what do I do? And uh, they guided me over to uh, some volunteer opportunities with, at the time, Congressman Oliver's office. And then that led to one thing, to another, to another. But uh, before that, it was a real rocky road for me because I didn't know how I was supposed to be behaving, what I was supposed to be doing, where do I go to access benefits and services? The transition from active duty to civilian. Yeah, exactly. You know, I'm and unfortunately, back. a lot of vet veterans don't know that we're, we have our offices. Every city and state, every city and town in Massachusetts, by law, has, has a, a veteran service officer. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, though, a lot of vets don't even know we're there until they're in crisis, until they're in a bad spot. Mm. And um, no, I wish there was somehow when they were getting out, when they were ETS, and they're like, go see your VSO. ETS? End of time and service. End of time Sorry. and service. It's, it's yeah. multiple different, but that's basically yeah. the gist of it. And yeah. ESO? <coughs> Veteran service officer. VSO. Veterans VSO. Yeah. Veteran service officer. That's yeah. you. Yes, that is yeah. me. Well, Massachusetts, we, we say VSO as in every city and town's VSO, Veteran yeah. service officer. But if you look at the VA, they'll mention VSO a lot. That's a veteran service organization, mm. which ah. is, could be the, the American Legion or the VFW yeah. or some place that, that does you know, veterans mm -hmm. benefits or veterans assistance. But it's totally separate than for our local VSOs. Yeah. So when, uh, what's the thing that you wish, you know, what's the thing that you find that veterans kind of don't know most about, besides that you even exist? <laughs> <laughs> well, I focus, we do claims and all that, and a lot of them don't even know they can file a claim. Mm -hmm. File a claim for, for health benefits? For, or? Well, no, if they got injured in the service. Oh. Like, for instance, when I was in, when I was in, I messed up my ankles in basic training. I was out for 10 years before I found out that I could file a claim for that. So, um, and I happened to find out my husband and I were shooting pool and I wound up just coincidentally sitting next to the VSO from Marlboro. Uh -huh. And we're talking about the military and whatnot and I told him about it. He goes, well, you filed a claim, right? And I says, what do you mean? So took it from there and so that's like a like a disability kind of claim well, the, they call it a dis service connected disability service but connected disability yeah, i don't like, words yeah. disability compensation Com compensation so the compensation it's not a full blown disability where you can still work it's to compensate for the injuries and the issues yeah. that you suffered in your military service to and make the, up for the difference what you may not be able to do now uh -huh. the, there are a lot of veterans that don't want to file a claim they're like, oh, well, Too proud. so and so got hurt worse than I did. This happened to this. This is only, you know, and the way I explain it to them, say you had a job, like when GE was in business, say you were working at GE, you hurt yourself on the job or wherever you're going to work. If that affects you for the rest of your life, would you or would you not get a settlement? 
And yep. they're like, well, yeah. And I says, it's the same exact thing, but it happens to be the U.S. government. Do you, do you feel you're entitled to so compensation? Then that's exactly well, that's, what it that's, is. That's, that's the problem right <laughs> there, because nobody feels entitled to the compensation, because every branch of the service, whether it's you know the Army, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, Navy, but if I go in, you got the Air Force. You got know. the Air Force. All right, anyways, <laughs> we're, we're killing time here. <laughs> Each one of those branches has in their core ethos something that mentions service before self or the core before you. Mm. You know, you're taking care of the whole. So another part of that is never leave a fallen comrade or never leave somebody behind. So when they come home and they look at somebody who may be injured worse than they are, maybe they're missing a limb, maybe they have some sort of physical injury uh, that, that can be seen just by looking at the person, and the person that's coming home wants to file, I may have something that may not be as easily seen. Yeah. That person's like, no, they need it more. I want to take care of my veterans and my brothers and sisters before I take that money. And, yeah. Or I want to do something for the greater good before I take care of myself. And trying to break them off of that and let them realize that this is what it's here. It's here for all of us. Yeah. And Let's they, they, they have to understand, I also explain to them, because you get yours does not mean John right. or Jill yeah. is not, not a, going to get yeah. hers. There's not a limited pot. Right. No. So yeah, there's enough to go around. So now, how, now to, is is there not a limit? It's an unlimited pot, or well, not that many? It, it's all under the budget. I mean, we're not we're, we're not having shortages right now. I mean, if the people are filing VA service connections for veterans and and the money is there, I would be shocked if in Massachusetts um, the political the senators and the representatives vote down ben veterans benefits. Yeah, no, that's that, that's it ain't gonna happen right now. I, I've found. Um, it, all of the political people that I've dealt with so far, including the city, mm -hmm. the council, so supportive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, our, our veterans' yeah. benefits uh, went up this last year, right? By they, they, I don't know some large twenty percent or they. I don't remember exact the exact amount, but yep. they've been going up consistently mm -hmm. every year because the city pays a portion of uh, veterans the, benefits the city pays it all and the state reimburses the city 75 percent in certain situations the state actually reimburses 100 percent mm. um, let's depending say, on what the benefit is yeah, if we if we're t helping somebody that's in transitional housing like the high, high street homestead up there the veteran homestead okay yes if we're helping somebody that lives there the this, this city gets reimbursed 100%. Mm. If we we help somebody every now and then, it's a first, last in security. If it's a homeless situation, the state reimburses 100%. So it's um, it's a great program. Yeah. So, so and I'd like to get the word out to more of our elders too, because probably a good 95% of the clients that are on Chapter 115 are elders or disabled. And, you know, I'll go to the, the sundial, I'll go to the Joseph house, and I'll talk about it. But the hardest ones to reach are those that live in private homes. Okay, yes. So. Because you don't know who's, who's yeah. out there and who served. Right. With that also, do you want to take just a quick second to talk about medical budget only type situations on 115? Medical budget yeah. only? Yeah. So they can, yeah. Well, part of, there's two different parts of the program. And as I explained to you in one of our finance committee meetings, there, you can't just take the flat numbers and say whether they're eligible or not. It depends. What we do is we build what we call a budget. Mm. The state sets out sets out the numbers. Yep. Depending on if they're married, if they're uh, pay, if they're pay, what they're paying rent or mortgage, if they pay their own heat, if they have children. So we set what we call their budget. Mm -hmm. If their income is lower than their budget, we pay them the difference. Now. Most of those budgets are below $2,000. Even if you're over that level, you can be up to about $2,800 as a married couple and still get what we call a medical only budget, which means we'll reimburse them for their supplemental insurance, we'll reimburse them what uh, they haven't taken out of their Social Security for their Medicare, mm. reimburse prescriptions, doctor's appointments, anything medically related. So, and I insurance, have, health insurance? Yes, the supplemental health insurance. I have couples, they get $600 a month just because we're reimbursing them. I mean, the average supplemental is about 200 and you figure if it's a hundred, that's 400 right there, yeah. 135 each for their Medicare. You that can at, make a big difference it if makes you're a huge from, from difference. zero to 600. It makes a huge difference. That can make a big difference, difference. in your food budget, and yep. what you can pay for your prescriptions, or what you can no. pay well, that's just your it. mortgage. Not, that's just if, it. If they're not really paying. Or, yeah, they're not really paying for their prescriptions because we're reimbursing them. Yeah. So it's like having free medical 
for the, for the elderly and the disabled. What about um, vocational rehabilitation and counseling? Oh, what about it? <laughs> I what, actually, what kind of time we got actually, yeah, <laughs> actually, that's a, that's how I wound up being a VSO. When I became, when I uh, became service connected, part of my service connected. Service connected. Yep. So that means that you file the claim with the with the VA, okay. the Veterans yep. Benefits, and you have a level of service connection disability. So you're yep. anywhere from zero percent up to a hundred. Okay. And then okay. sometimes even more in certain situations. Yeah. So, so if you have a small injury, you'd have a small percentage of... Exactly. Yeah, say somebody broke their foot in the Army and it got better and they got out, it's not bothering them, but when they filed the, a claim when they got out of the VA, they might say, okay, yeah, you have a broken bone, there's some issues down there, it's fixed, we're going to give you a zero percent. Now, yeah. if that gets worse, then we can go back and reevaluate that and lift that up. Mm. But the, the rates are always adjustable. Yeah. So when I became service-connected, um, actually at that time, I was working in a warehouse. And um. my, part of my service connection was for the ankle injuries. So you can stand for long periods Exactly. Of time. So since my service-connected disability, I hate that they call it a disability, but since my service-connected disability was hindering my job, I went and I applied for voc rehab. Mm -hmm. Got approved. Started going to school. When you're going to school on voc rehab, you're allowed to do a work study up to 20 hours a week, and the VA pays you. The only, con the only catch is you have to be working with veterans. So it just so happened, the town that I was living in at the time, the secretary had just retired, the VSO had just retired, and I went in just as, hey, you want me to answer your phones, do some filing? Let me help out. Yeah, exactly. So um, the new VSO that they hired, it used to be a district, it was Clinton, Lancaster, Berlin, Bolton, Sterling, a whole bunch of towns. Mm -hmm. He only wanted Clinton. So three of the towns approached me and asked me if I would be their VSO. Ah. So Vogue Rehab is actually what what got you yeah, what and, got you going yeah, and in that the position was that you're in. Fifteen years ago today. Ah. I mean this the second, January second, so fifteen years ago this month. And you've been so. the Fitchburg Veterans VSO July eighth will be eight years. Eight years. Eight years. Yeah. Doesn't seem it. <laughs> Go by just Are we like busier that. in Fitchburg than uh Oh, in the other towns that I was, oh, I had three little towns. I was in Berlin, Bolton, and Lancaster. Mm -hmm. So I worked part-time, a couple of days a week. Coming to Fitchburg was like a whole new world. <laughs> yeah. We're a lot busier yeah. here? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And I have to say, I love my job. I, there's days where I'm just like, oh, what am, I, what am I doing? Just because you get stressed. It's so busy. But the, I can honestly say there's never a day that I go home that I don't know that I helped somebody, that I made a difference for somebody. Yeah. So That's a good feeling. Yeah, it, it is. <laughs> Sometimes I feel funny calling it a job. but And you must feel that a lot um, as well. And it, you must have a very high stress job and crisis so, intervention. Yeah, when we're rocking and rolling, it's, it can be pretty intense sometimes. So, you suicide prevention? Yeah, so the SAVE team um, historically... Therapy? Uh, we don't, we're all peer-based. Everybody on the team is a combat veteran or the immediate family member of a combat vet. So when we deal with the vets in crisis, we're really relying on our on our own training experiences. So and what you can relate to home. them. You can say, I, I, exactly. I know what, you, you, what you've gone through. Yep, I exactly. was there. Exactly. And, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, I have a service dog from the needs program in Princeton, Mass., the Yellow Lab. And, oh. and he's, no, unfortunately not here tonight because it just makes entirely too much noise for any kind of you know, recording. Next but time you have to bring him. I'll, I'll bring him. We'll have to like, just duct tape <laughs> him. What's his, name? his name is Sammy. Sammy. Oh, Sammy that's the my favorite dog. name. <laughs> there you go. Right? <laughs> Sammy the service dog. But um, he makes my job a lot easier. When I got him, I really needed him. I was, I was kind of messed up. People, and relax. They do. So I, I show they, up someplace some out in Greenfield, and I'm, I'm trying to bird dog a vet who's made some threats. and Bird dog? Hunting somebody down. Like, oh, kinda, yeah, okay. Trying to get him out, flush him out, find out where they're at. And um, I'm just some guy from the state. They don't know me. They don't want to talk to me. But when I show up there with the dog, they'll mm. pet the dog. They'll talk to the dog. He, he breaks that ice and he starts that conversation. And that dog has personally saved a couple of It's like of a lives. therapy dog. He is. He went from my assistant's dog to being, he's my battle buddy now. I'm literally, I'm just a guy with a dog. That's what people know me as all across the I like world. him better with the dog, too. I'm much more pleasant to be around with the dog. Everybody's better with a dog. <laughs> it is, yeah. He earns his keep. But uh, yeah, he makes that job a lot easier. And. Um, I was on the road doing the, the save team, like the crisis intervention, full time for a good number of years. I've kind of transitioned my role a little bit now into uh, more of a training side of things. I still, you know, cover the Worcester County, Hampton, Hampshire, Franklin, and Berkshire uh, with my staff that's based out of the Holyoke Soldiers Home. 
but a lot of the work I do now is training uh, local and state police, fire departments, EMS. In uh, crisis intervention crisis for veterans? Crisis intervention, working with veterans, how to uh, identify veterans, how to speak to them, you know, military culture, uh, how to deal with them when they're in crisis, how to identify certain triggers and, and things that may be setting somebody off. Um, and how to properly deal with that with um, a cultural sensitivity. And uh, we do that through battle mind training. That sounds important. It is, it's good. Yeah. And it's, it's something that, that something really that doesn't exist Something that you don't really think about until, until you're taught it. Yes, yeah. exactly, exactly. So the local hospitals around here have been great. Uh, the hospitals in Worcester have been great. So when they have a veteran come in, uh, they're doing a good job at identifying the history of military service. And then they're plugging them into the proper benefits and services that are out there. Or instead of keeping somebody in a mental health bed at Lemister, they're quick to get on the phone with the VA and they're getting them out to West Roxbury yeah. or Brockton, wherever they're gonna send them, to get them in their proper care that can focus on uh, the issues they're dealing with that are military related. So if um, uh, if someone needs to reach you, how do we, how do we reach the, the SAVE team? So the SAVE team, the uh, best way to reach us, you can call us directly at 617-210-5743. Uh, we also have an 888 number, 888-844-2838. That does not work at all areas of the Commonwealth. Uh, depending on how far west you are. Mm. Uh, we'll also be uh, located at mass.gov slash veterans. Uh, that's the uh, mass.gov state website. Um, there's a safe team link on there. And uh, there's another website that we use um, extensively to find locate services. It's called massvetsadvisor.org. Massvetsadvisor.org. <laughs> it's basically the yellow pages of veterans benefits. Mm. You can yeah. go on there. And it also, it, it also lists mm -hmm. all of the numbers for the veteran services across the state. Uh -huh. So we can so find Fitchburg's. Exactly. You can find Fitchburg yeah, on there. You can, wherever you're from, if you need the number, you can find it on there. <laughs> and for our veterans uh, in Fitchburg yep. that uh, want to contact you, what are the hours? What's the we number? were there Monday through Friday, 8.30 to 4.30. At the, at the at Armory? The 14 Wallace Ave, Armory slash Senior Center, mm -hmm. and uh, it's 978-829-1797. And they, they can just pop so in during they, that time? They can pop in. Um, if they need to sit down with me, I highly suggest that they call and make an appointment. Only because, because it's busy? If, if I'm with somebody, it, I might be with that person for an hour, mm -hmm. and we don't want people to have to sit and wait that long. So they can pop in and make an appointment, they can call and make an appointment. If they just have a quick question, hopefully I'm free. Yep. If not, I can get right back to them. All right. So. Well, thank you so much, Gabe thank you. Nutter from the, from the State Veterans Office, <laughs> and Michelle Marino, our Fitchburg Veterans Commissioner. Yes. Um, so we're going to take a break, and then when we come back on, we'll be talking with Rich Bastion, the um, Veterans Memorial Cemetery oh. Director. Correct. Is that right? Okay. There you go. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, Sam Squalia here with Eladio Romero, and we're talking about the Massachusetts Health Connector, the insurance program. Yes. Right? Yes. And because uh, the deadline for signups is coming up soon, January 23rd. Yes. So one week from today, uh, folks have um, the opportunity to go on to the Massachusetts Health Connector and register for an insurance plan if they do not have one mm -hmm. currently. Um, the Health Connector is essentially a marketplace with various um, insurance plans that are available to folks and affordable and it's for health and dental as well. So who can sign up for Mass Health Connect insurance? This is for open to all Massachusetts yep. residents without that don't obviously don't yes. have employer insurance? Well actually some folks who do have insurance through work um, I have heard of folks who um, say that their plans are too expensive for them mm -hmm. and so they go on to the Mass Health Connector. And then you can put in your information Absolutely, you can look yes. at the different... Yep, and you can do it on your own or you can actually call a number and then a navigator will help walk you through the process. And let's pull up that number in that website uh, up on the screen, please. Okay, so you can go to MassHealthConnector.org, which you can mm -hmm. see right on the screen, and we have a phone number as well. And you could call that number, and you can a yep, and representative you'll, you'll get a representative, will yep, and walk you through you the process it. essentially, and help you determine which plan is is going to be best for you, and which one is going to be most affordable. That's what the navigators are there for, um, because also you want to ensure that the plan that you choose is going to cover the services that you actually need. Mm -hmm. um, so that's important. And the deadline for this is January 23rd. And what happens if January 24th we wake up and we go, oops? I didn't well, sign up. Well, um, 
anyone, so currently Massachusetts has 97 percent of its residents um, insured, people have health insurance. There's so still three percent, that three percent of folks um, who are not insured, who wake up on the 24th and say, oops, I forgot, when they file their taxes in uh, for the 2019 year, uh, they will be assessed a penalty. So Massachusetts does require um, that everyone have insurance, it is a mandate still in the state of Massachusetts. So make sure to go to mahealthconnector.org or you can call that number on your screen and check out the insurance options. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they vary for everyone based on whatever insurance you'll plug in. Yep, absolutely. Your, uh, also your income. Um, so they'll ask your household size. So they'll ask you a lot of information and essentially, again, the navigators are there to walk you through the process. Um, so you don't have to do this alone, but you certainly can. You can go online and do it yourself if you feel comfortable doing it. So, okay. yes. Thanks, Aladia. Anything well, thank else you. we need to know about the um, uh, No, just please trends? don't forget the deadline, January 23rd, next Wednesday. Um, please be sure, to, um, if you're not covered or if you're looking for a more affordable plan, please do so by then. All right, thank you. Thanks. And welcome back to Discussing Fitchburg Now. I'm your host, Sam Squalia. In this segment of our Veterans Resources Show, we're talking with Rich Bastine, uh, the director of the... Massachusetts Veterans Memorial Cemeteries. Massachusetts Veterans Memorial Cemeteries. Thank you for coming on. Thank you, Sam. It's a pleasure being on. All right. So, the Massachusetts Veterans Memorial Cemeteries. We have two in that you control. That's correct. We have two in Massachusetts. Two total in Massachusetts. Yes, hmm. the two state-run ones in Massachusetts, and there's also the national one uh, down in Bourne. The national one. So do you do that one as well? That or? one's run just by the federal government. Mm -hmm. And then the two that are located in uh, Winchenden and Agawam, it's a federal state partnership uh, that run those two. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have Agawam and, and Winchenden mm -hmm. are our Massachusetts state Memorial Veterans Cemeteries. Yes. Yes. Um, and it's interesting, you know, one of the things that we talk about quite a bit uh, when I go out to different groups to talk about the cemeteries is that they're not just the Winchenden Cemetery or the Agawam Cemetery. Um, over 75% of all of the cities and towns in Massachusetts have at least one veteran interred in one of those two facilities. So it's really a resource for the entire state for veterans to use. It's the it's the veterans cemetery. Absolutely. Right, that's one that's located in Winchenden and one that's located in Agawam. Absolutely. And now for Bourne, what's the distinction uh, between, you know, where you might want to have your, you know, final resting place? So Bourne was set up first. It was it was begun uh, late 70s, early 80s. Um, the, a couple things that are different there. Uh, they have flat markers if you've ever been down there. Um, it's a little bit different of a look when you visit their facility. Uh, it's very pastoral, uh, looks like wide expanses of fields uh, where thousands of veterans are actually interred. And that's the look they were going for in the 70s and 80s. Uh, when these two cemeteries were established, they were looking for a different, different look. Uh, one of the things that we always say is that the price of freedom is visible here. And we want visitors with when, the headstones. Exactly right. We have the upright headstones, and we want visitors when they come in. School children come in a lot of times with uh, different groups uh, to really, you know, see that impact of the service of those that are interred there. And, and I think when you see the upright stones lined up uh, perfectly in a row, uh, just like Arlington, it really hits home uh, the service it, of those there. It does feel powerful. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the what are the stones made of? In uh, they're granite stones. They weigh about 250 pounds each. Mm. Uh, staff install them uh, throughout the year, so uh, it's very labor intensive. Um, but it's it's an old process we use, just strings and and levels, and uh, it's amazing to see uh, the work that goes in and make sure that they're lined up exactly perfect. And it's that level of care uh, that our staff puts into it, so that we know that at some point there's a family coming out there to visit their loved one. And we want everyone to have that respect to know that we took that care to line that stone up perfect for them. Mm -hmm. And so, what what is the history of the, the cemeteries? How long has these cemetery? How long has the Winchenden and the Agawam cemeteries been under the Massachusetts? Sure. Uh, when did when did they begin? Sure. So, before the two cemeteries came online, um, if you were a veteran in Massachusetts, you had to go to Bourne. Bourne. And if you were from Vermont or Rhode Island, you had to go to Bourne. Oh, well, really? And uh, you know, it was so it was really, a, it's like a New England. Yeah, uh, so it's it's regional. It, it was basically the, the idea when they created Bourne was that all of the veterans in New England would have a national cemetery to go to, 
But you know, it's really inconvenient for families, uh, particularly from central and, and western Massachusetts, mm. to drive all the way to the Cape, you know, forget about the traffic in the summertime trying to get over the bridges sure. uh, to visit their loved ones. So the state went into partnership with the federal government and uh, Bourne came online in 2001, Winchenden came online in 2004. Uh, both cases, the land was donated uh, to the cemeteries uh, by different groups and um, you know, we have enough land uh, at the cemetery in Winchenden for burials for next 200 to 300 years. Oh, wow. Absolutely. That's a lot of land. Yeah, you know, and it's it's just that commitment that's made to those veterans to let them know that um, not only are we going to be there for them today, but uh, we're going to be there for them tomorrow as well to take care of those cemeteries uh, with the standards that we have. So what? who can be buried at the Veterans Memorial Cemetery? What, what is the definition of a, of a veteran? That sure. was kind of a loaded, that was a loaded question when I brought it up with Gabe. Right. Um, what, what is a veteran sure. for, the, for, the, for the cemetery's definition? Yep, that's a great question. And uh, you know, the, what we base the, the qualifications on are the qualifications set forth by the VA. And what they determine basically is that anybody that has an honorable discharge um, that meets the certain length of service for their time period. Uh, for instance, before September 7th, 1980, mm. you have to It's do only least, one day, right? You have to do at least one day of active duty, not for training. So if you went to boot camp and then somehow had an issue in boot camp and get discharged, still not eligible. Mm. You have to do at least one day- Active duty. Beyond that, um, before 1980. After September 7th, 1980, you have to do two years. Um, there are all sorts of different uh, circumstances that come up where somebody might have um, their parents pass away while they serve on active duty and they're called home to take care of younger uh, siblings. Mm. And so there's all sorts of things in there that sometimes that two year requirement's waived for different circumstances. But generally speaking, honorable discharge uh, in that period of service and you're in. If you have a dishonorable discharge, you're out. And that's, that seems pretty much across the board. If absolutely. you're dishonorably discharged, you don't get any, yeah. you're not a veteran. Now, if you're anywhere in between, and there's a whole host of different discharges, uh, general discharges, administrative discharges, um, other than honorable, basically at that point what we do is we send the information uh, to St. Louis, to the National Archives, and we let them make that determination mm. as to whether that veteran is eligible or not. And that's why it's really important, uh, because sometimes that can take two weeks. And families, a lot of times, when they're looking to do an internment for their loved one, they don't have two weeks. Right. So we constantly try to tell them, come in ahead of time, pre-register, right. and let us vet that information ahead of time. Uh, put a, your, your, very, your end of life care plan. Exactly right. You know, there's a lot of circumstances that come up with um, veterans where they may not have a discharge, they can't find their discharge, and we can find that information for them. Mm. Uh, we can also refer them to like Michelle, who can look up that information Your for local them. veterans you, service officer. Your local veterans service officer, and they do a great job uh, throughout the state, and that's one of the reasons why we look forward to working in partnership with them to help families. Um, but, you know, in a time crunch, uh, particularly when someone passes away, some uh, religions, they want to inter the uh, person within 24 hours. Oh, and so, what do you do then? Well, it, hopefully they've come and pre-registered ahead of time because we cannot, we cannot bury one person that's not eligible. So we have to make that eligibility determination prior to them being buried. Mm -hmm. So those circumstances, if they've come in, if they pre-registered, brought their information in, we can inter them within 24 hours three you know all the way through the year rain snow hot we'll do that internment next day if need be mm. um, but it's important that they come in ahead of time to give us that information so if there is an issue we can vet that check on it and then give them that final uh, good or no good so then you, before you they don't come in. make a, um, a bad situation worse exactly right you know a lot of veterans I'm a veteran myself um, you know, are very honest with their loved ones about their, their time in the service. Um, there are some veterans for different circumstances um, have embellished their, their time that they've done. Mm. Um, sometimes we've had families that have come in, they'll bring their loved ones discharge into us and we'll confirm it and say, yep, uh, you know, they're, they're private Sanders and, and we're gonna inter them and they're eligible. No, 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 my grandfather said he's Colonel Sanders and you know, I don't understand why you're calling him a private. Well, 
all the documentation that we have from the military says he's pri private Sanders. Ooh, that sounds so like unless a tough you, situation. It, it's a very tough situation and we want to be compassionate for people because you know they're going through a lot mm. and we understand that you know um, most of my staff um, either have family that are that are veterans or they're veterans themselves um, some of us you know one of my grandfathers is interred at the Winchin Cemetery so we we know um, that someone was there for us when we were grieving we're there for them now while they're grieving and um, at some point ho hopefully not tomorrow if I'm lucky um, you know I'll be interred there as well and somebody's going to be there to take care of my family mm -hmm. so we want to help them but we also have to go by what the documents say yep there's a standard. That's the standard. So, um, what is the cost to sure. be buried uh, at the Memorial Cemetery? So, the great thing about the benefit for veterans is there's no cost to the veteran or their family for the burial of the veteran once they come into the gates. So, that includes the headstone, the opening, the closing of the grave, the plot itself, um, the service, the flagpole, the military honors, all that is taken care of at no cost to them. Whatever they do before, no cost no, at all. No cost to the veteran. What uh, kind of a savings is that? A, a typical oh, gosh. funeral. So if you're talking about eight, eight thousand, uh, probably close to that, six to eight thousand dollars for a veteran and their spouse. Um, there is a small cost for the spouse. Hmm. Now, if their uh, spouse, if you're doing a casket interment, you're looking at about three hundred dollars. What our cost would be for them? Three hundred. Yep, and that covers everything again. The the the. Um, the plot, the opening, the closing, um, the vaults that are inside. Um, wow. If they're in urn interment. Urn. Um, Is that where they're in the wall? So we the have. The columbarium? Yes, that's a great question. We have three types of interment that we can do, and we make uh, no distinction on what to do. It's entirely what the family wants to do. So some uh, different families or religions want to go with a, a traditional casket burial. Mm. Yep. We have those available. Um, they're either single depth if the veteran's single, or if the veteran and spouse are together, they're a double depth vault with a concrete shelf between them. Oh. Um, that's how you would do your casket burials. A if vault, you're doing, when you say vault, this is concrete encased. Yep, it's a concrete liner um, with, you know, basically big old box, concrete, mm -hmm. um, with a lid that goes on top of it. And that's what the casket would go into. And uh, if you're a cremation, You've got two options. You can either be a cremation that's placed in the ground or a cremation that's placed into the wall. And uh, different people like different things. So again, we make no difference on it. If they want to be in the ground, that's fine. They want to go on the wall, that's fine too. And so we, if you want to be buried with your spouse, you need to know that ahead of time. Um, yes and no. And uh, that's a great question that you brought up because there are some spouses um, that one wants to be a casket and one wants to be an urn and we have the ability to accommodate that. We just need to know ahead of time when the first spouse passes away, what's the intentions of the second spouse. Um, and then we still have an opportunity um, that if somebody changes their mind down the road, um, working with the family, we can make sure that they're still interred. Uh, just some just came to my mind. What happens if your spouse passes away and they're buried and then you get a second spouse? That's a great question. Um, spouses are allowed to remarry, uh, the, the one qualification for being eligibly buried at the cemetery is that you have to be married to the veteran either at their passing or at your passing. Uh, we do have situations where we have veterans that have had multiple spouses or spouses that might have been married to multiple veterans. Mm. Um, and basically, uh, it's on the family when that spouse or that veteran passes away who they get interred with. We stay out of it. There's a lot of family dynamics involved. Yeah. Um, so uh, if you're the veteran mm -hmm. and your spouse passes away first, mm -hmm. can the spouse be buried at the veterans? Yes. So the, it's a common misconception um, that the spouse has to pass away after the veteran. The spouse can be buried first. And we have situations where we have veterans that might have been married twice, first spouses interred, they're married to their second spouse. Can you have a triple death? You can have, we, we have one that, well, they're in different locations. Oh, okay. So they wouldn't be all in the same plot. Okay. But um, they w can have a situation where you can have two spouses that have already preceded you, buried at the cemetery, and you're married to your third spouse, and if the veteran should pass away, generally it would be on the third spouse to make the uh, Decision. determination 
We, we stay out of it. We let the family figure that out on their own. Ah. So, uh, but, but it, that's probably not a common, I don't know, is that probably, common? Probably not common. Um, generally speaking, especially this day and age, we have a lot of uh, World War II veterans that have, uh, you know, getting closer to the end of their, their uh, time. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, uh, it's heartbreaking sometimes when you see a family come through that have been married for 50, 60 years. And, uh, you know, we're there for them because we know um, that's got to be hard to go through. And our goal is to make it as easy on the family when they're going through it. We basically just want to handle the paperwork, take care of them, and basically be as invisible as possible to just get them through that, that time in their life. So, I mean, but at all of this, it sounds like uh, preparing in advance is going to be the best for all parties. I can't stress how much preparing in advance makes a difference. Like if you're a veteran and you know that uh, you would like to be included and you, you would like to be buried there mm -hmm. at the Memorial Cemetery, call you up, uh, what, what is, wh where do yeah. they go? So the best thing that they can do, uh, take, a ride, take a ride up there. Mm -hmm. um, bring take your a spouse, look at it. Take a look at it. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly... Is it open? So, yep, so the grounds are open, um, dust to dawn, dust to dawn, 365 days a year. Um, unless there's severe weather that we would need to close the gates. Our office up there is open Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, we're staffed with the exception of holidays. And you know they can come up and just ask questions if they need to. Mm -hmm. um, but the important thing is get up there, take a look at it. Um, every headstone's the same. There's no pre-purchased pre Plot, so because they're all free. Yeah, you know the way it is is that you know when we were in the service, we all get the same chow, we all get the same bunk yep. um, style. You know, you all get the same bedding, um, and everybody gets the same service, the same plot. It doesn't matter if they're a private or they're a general. Uh huh. And uh, you so know, everyone gets the same service. What does the service entail? Sure. Typically, the service is about uh, 20, 25 minutes. Um, that includes the family coming in. Uh, they're allowed to have one person speak for about five to seven minutes. It can be a clergy like a member. Priest. Yep. Uh, it can be a family member if they uh, don't want a religious person speaking at their service. Doesn't matter to us, but it's just one person because we want to be consistent. We don't want one person getting eight people to speak at their service and the next person gets one person to speak at their service. Okay, so one gets person one. gets to speak for approximately five minutes. Five minutes and then we have military honors involved. The military folds the flag. Firing detail um, will do a three round volley. Um, three pass. round, uh, that's the, the, the shooting the gun? Three, yeah. three, three shots. Three, three rounds, so um, you know, they'll line up and um, it's really moving when you see it. Um, you know, even before I came on as director about three years ago, I had visited the cemetery a number of times. I uh, started doing it because of Wreaths Across America oh, when they were okay. up there. And um, I think when you see it, you really, it hits home with you um, how much all these veterans that come up to volunteer for the fight, they're all volunteers. They're not getting paid. For the they're, Wreaths Across America? For talking. Wreaths Across America or the firing detail that comes in, they're volunteering their time to take care of a fellow veteran uh, to pay them respect. Hmm. And uh, it's a community effort. We have uh, different veterans groups from all over um, North Central Massachusetts for the uh, Winchenden Cemetery and Western Massachusetts for the Agawam Cemetery that take their time to come out to, uh, to volunteer to you know, pay respect to those veterans. And did you say they play TAPS? So, yep, TAPS is sounded with every veteran service. Mm -hmm. um, and that's our way of making sure that they're honored. Um, then obviously there's some services where the family wants to have a service and that's when we have the military honors and the folding of the flag. Some families decide to do that, you know, maybe at the funeral home or, you know, privately. Yep. And then that's when we'll do just the uh, signing of taps uh, when they arrive um, for the interment. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so <clears throat> everyone gets the granite headstone. Mm -hmm. Now, what are the different symbols on the top, because that's, that's the one thing that changes, right? That's a great question. Um, you know, it used to be maybe about 10, 15 years ago, you had your traditional religious denominations. Uh, you know, you had your Christian, your- uh, The cross, the star. Of star. David, uh, you know, uh, symbol for the Muslim faith. Yep. Um, and then now I believe it's there's up to eagle, about- There's an eagle, right? Yep, there's, there's um, I believe there's about 45 to 60 different uh, emblems of belief now. Again, it makes no difference to us um, what families decide. Um, there's even the option that you can have 
uh, one, the veteran may be of one religious faith, and perhaps the spouse is either of a different religious faith, or maybe they're agnostic and don't want a religious symbol or want some um, landing eagle, generally is um, you know, a heroic um, sem uh, okay. symbol of belief. Yep. Um, we even have like Hammer of Thor, which is a oh. uh, traditional symbol of a warrior. Okay. So there's all sorts of different options. They add to them uh, at the VA all the time and basically whatever the VA okays is what we go with. Mm -hmm. And so you have your your name, your uh, rank, mm -hmm. and what's in the, I don't, what were the numbers below this? It looks like based on whatever branch of the service you're so, in? Yeah, so the headstones, we have the headstones, we also have the niche covers. Niche covers. Those are the ones that go on the columbarium. Okay. Those, uh, because of space limitations, have less information that can go on there. So, generally speaking, you'll see like the, the year of someone's birth and the year of their passing, but on the headstones you can do the complete birthday, complete day of passing, um, all the information about their rank, their service, um, and uh, their information for their names mm -hmm. as well. All right. So, say I wanna go and I wanna put flowers in front of the, the gravestone. Yep. Can I do that? You absolutely can. Um, we do have uh, a rather strict policy on uh, decorations. It, uh, there's a whole like flower yeah. thing. And, and the reason we do that is we want it to be a dignified uh, place for people to come visit. Mm -hmm. So and you uniform. Know, uniform. Uh, uniform's the key. Uh, we're not letting. We're not telling one family they can have something, another family can't. The easiest thing is fresh cut flowers are available. You can place them around all year long. We don't allow artificial flowers. We don't allow balloons or pinwheels or lights or anything of that nature. Um, fresh cut flowers is what we usually recommend to everybody to come up. They place them in the vases that we provide at mm -hmm. the cemetery. Which are right there in, in, in nice Right there dispensers. next to our water fountains that are right there. And then um, you know, as those flowers uh, wilt, my staff will then remove them. Um, and the idea is that you know, we want people to come back and visit those loved ones. We don't want artificial flowers that are that are left lingering and and then you know for multiple months or whatever. We want them coming up and, and continually showing uh, love to the people that are there. Mm -hmm. uh, the grounds are really impressive. Uh, that was you know the, with the, the very nice flower vase holders, the water fountains, the the landscape edging. Th that happens year round. Yeah, we we landscape the grounds year round. Um, that entire cemetery is taken care of with six ground staff, and they, they're the ones that... I'm specifically um, talking about Winchington because I haven't seen that's Agawam. Okay. Um, you know, Agawam, similar uh, circumstances, but, you know, my staff handles the, the actual interments. You know, in the wintertime, we're plowing, uh, we're shoveling to make sure people can get out mm -hmm. to visit their loved ones. Um, in the summertime, we're mowing and, and uh, continually, you know, seeding and cleaning. Um, and, you know, again, it's, these are the rules set forth by the federal government um, to get the money to... Um, their standard. That's their standard. We have the same standards for groundskeeping that are at the national cemeteries. Mm. And so we have a really high standard that we have to meet. It is very nice. Well, thank you. And, um, you know, it's our mission that we say, you know, this is the expectation that every family should have, um, and that's the benefit we offer. Mm -hmm. If you go to a local cemetery, um, a municipal cemetery, you know, maybe if it's 50 years, 100 years old, it might not have been mowed, it might not have been taken care of as much. We're mowing every single week, multiple times a week. It is a very high standard. Thank you, oh, yeah. and um, it's, it's our commitment to veterans and their families that we want them to know that their loved one is, you know, the area is properly maintained for them. Uh, so we we spoke about wreath across, wreaths across America, mm -hmm. and uh, that was that was a great event. Thank you. And uh, I know uh, for like the Fourth of July, there's a, a flag. You place Memorial flags on Memorial Day. Memorial Day. That's right. So Memorial Mem Day. Yep. So we have three big events throughout the year. Three big events. Uh, so Memorial Day obviously is our big biggest single event. Usually the governor, lieutenant governor, um, will come out to visit the two cemeteries. Um, the Wednesday before Memorial Day. We have flags that go out uh, between both facilities. We put out 13,000 to 14,000 flags. Um, obviously can't be done without the volunteers. Mm. And uh, they're tremendous um, school kids, different organizations that come up that help out. Um, and then we have our Memorial Day service. 
um, every year. Um, it's 9 a.m. on Memorial Day in Winchenden. Every year, 9 a.m. 9 a.m. in Winchenden. So Memorial if, you're, Day. if you're out there and you're watching this, uh, make sure you come up there on uh, Memorial Day to come come visit. It's a good opportunity to uh, visit the grounds and see the kind of um, dignity that comes uh, up there. Incredible volunteerism. I was there for the, the Wreaths Across America, and oh, I, I was really surprised at how many people came out in the cold to lay wreaths. You know, it's amazing uh, the amount of people that are invested in making sure that they come up there. Uh, we have some people that, that don't even have a uh, family member buried there, but mm. they just want to be there. They want to help out, and uh, this past year and we be had- be part of the uh, camaraderie. Yeah, we had uh, well over 300, 400 people they came up to place over 3,000 wreaths um, just before the uh, Christmas season. Yeah. And uh, you know, it's amazing to get up there this time of year to see that little bit of snow. I know we don't want to say that word, but um, <laughs> you know, when you really see the wreaths out there, and the most important thing is when those wreaths go out, we always tell people to say the name of that person that they're placing the wreath on. Yep. Um, so that their memory lives on by saying their name. And all wreaths have to have the bow at two o'clock. Certain angle at two o'clock, and it's it's really there again. It's the uniformity that we strive for. Oh, yeah, and it looks and it looks really good, and it's powerful when it's all placed. Thank you, and it's it's really a dedication to our ground staff, the volunteers, the families that come up there. You know, it's not something that one person can do by themselves, or even my entire staff can do by ourselves. It's all of the different communities throughout the area uh, coming up and participating. So. Now, if I want to find out if one of my relatives is buried at a national cemetery mm -hmm. or at a memorial cemetery, one of the Massachusetts ones, mm -hmm. how do I find that out? Sure, if you Google uh, VA Grave Finder. VA Grave Finder. VA Grave Finder. Um, org? Well, it, it'll take you to the oh, VA's you website. It and then um, it'll tell you. And it'll take you. Not find a grave. That's an entirely different thing that's I not. Use the, I use find a grave for my ancestry. Find a grave is not exactly accurate. And no offense against people that run nope. run that particular website, but well, it's the, kind of community, you know. Yeah, the VA Grave Finder is the official one. VA Grave Finder um, that we put the information into, and you, um, you would search name. Yeah, um, so you can go. So if you're looking for someone at the uh, Massachusetts Veterans Memorial Cemetery in Winchenden, that's what you would want to put in there. Is select that option, and then uh, you can put in. I think you can search by the beginning of their last name or their exact last name. You put that information in and it will tell you uh, where they're located. Um, I believe there's a map that's also shown. But again, if you think there's a loved one that you have up there, if you come by eight to four Monday through Friday, um, we'll you know, print up the map, show you exactly where they're located and um, you know, try to help you as much as possible. So you have a, a, a very nice building in Winchenden and staff there um, Monday through Friday. Yeah, our staff is there to take care of family as they're coming in. And um, you know, they're dedicated. You know, first, when that door opens up, whatever we're doing, that's, that's put aside. And we're there to take care of, of that person walking in the door first because you know, it might be someone that just lost their loved one yesterday and doesn't know who to turn to. So um, you know, we understand that mission and um, you know, that's our first priority. And every day we're, we're trying to help people uh, as best we can. Mm. Are there any other events that you can have um, if you, I don't know, want to have an event at the cemetery? Sure. Um, you know, sometimes there's different groups that have done bicycle, uh, motorcycle rides through there. Um, we are a public facility, so we are open. Our grounds are open on the weekends. You know, we just ask people to be respectful. Um, the grounds are open set. on the weekdays too? Weekdays, weekends, yeah. uh, you know, all the time. 365 days a year. 365 days a year they're open. So we're always asking people uh, to be respectful. Um, usually there's a bike ride that happens um, just before Memorial Day that comes out of Gardner. Um, if there's anybody that looks, that's looking to diff do those types of things, we ask that they check with us first so that we can just kind of discuss the different things that we'd like them to make sure that they're aware of when they're coming in. You know. Uh, if there's families that are um, perhaps just maybe lost a loved one, we'd like them to be respectful, you know, as they're coming into the cemetery mm -hmm. of other people's needs. So for more information, you can uh, contact your, your office. The sure. Um, it's the best way to maybe do it if you're looking for information at the Winchenden Cemetery, you can call 978-297-9501. Uh, um, Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., one of us will be there to answer the phone. And um, if there's any questions that people have, please let us know. This has been Discussing Fitchburg Now. We'll see you later.